Ray, thank you so much for joining me here today. You're welcome. Now, when it comes down to comparing microphones, what is the AES trying to do with regards to making sure that all microphones are on the same page or microphone manufacturers are on the same page with regards to their technical standards and testing? Well, the Audio Engineering Society has a working group uh, on what they call microphone characterization. So this is not how microphones are designed, but once you have a product, how do you create a data sheet for it with all of the specifications and the frequency response of the microphone and the polar response and uh, all of that sort of thing? And uh, so they've been working on this for, for many years because many, you know, all the different manufacturers all have slightly different ways that they have been doing their testing. And Ideally, obviously, as a microphone user, we would like to be able to compare the results from any manufacturer and know that you know you can you can compare uh, microphone A from manufacturer uh, X and microphone B from ma manufacturer Y. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that hasn't really been the case, and uh, so the the AS is is working to try to get the manufacturers uh, together on that. And uh, because of the different methodologies that each manufacturer uses to do their testing, um, they decided, well, why don't we get some manufacturers to agree to each contribute a microphone to a pool, and then we'll send this set of microphones around to the different manufacturers uh, that are contributing to this thing and let each manufacturer test the complete set of microphones. So then we can compare the test results. Sounds like a fair thing to ask. Yeah, and they, they did that. And there were 10 manufacturers, I believe, that uh, decided to cooperate and do the testing. And the what were problem, the results? <laughs> well, that's the problem. Uh, apparently, there were enough manufacturers that were embarrassed at how different their results were from other manufacturers that the companies decided they would not release the test results to anybody but the other 10 uh, uh, companies in a group of 10. They wouldn't even release them to the, the rest of the working group in the Audio Engineering Society. Interesting. So we don't know. <laughs> so how, how – now, I think one or two of the manufacturers released their results uh, to the entire group, but the rest of them said no. And – that just tells me that there's there's still a long way to go. Here. Still, it almost sounds like there's something to hide there even. Or maybe not necessarily intentional, like they're trying to pull one over on, them, on us, but maybe like their testing methods are not consistent and that could be comparison. It, it could be maybe embarrassing. Yes, yeah. And uh, um, the one of the embarrassing things I know from at least one of the manufacturers involved was that the one or two companies that did release the results to the entire group, um, this one manufacturer, they, they both had results that looked fairly similar. And one manufacturer's microphone that they had contributed to this um, did not test out as being very close to the specification, the published specifications, let's say. Really? So... The frequency response as it's posted is not necessarily something that is ironclad and should be taken really seriously from the point of view of this is how uh, this I can read it and therefore know exactly how a microphone sounds. Yeah, well, that's another whole issue the, uh, of can you can you look at a at a response and say this microphone sounds good or this microphone sounds bad. Um, I would say that you're probably much better being able to say, much more accurately being able to say, 
this is a lousy microphone from looking at the re at the test results than saying this is a good microphone for this particular application. So what and makes a good microphone based on what the specifications are that they're testing for? Oh, well, um, as according to the AES, you know what they're looking for. Well, the the, A, the the AES is just wanting to. They're not trying to say what a microphone should sound like or anything like that. They they're just trying to say, can we get specifications that can be compared between the various manufacturers? And let's just say they've had some some progress. Uh, you know, in particular, one of the things that I think they've gotten fairly well, you know, everybody a lot closer to agreeing on is how to measure the noise floor of a microphone. Mm. Okay. And so, uh, that, that has been one thing, which I think is a, a distinct, uh, improvement. Uh, but, uh, it's, it, there's, there's still a long way to go, let's say, uh, getting, uh, uh, everything. And uh, personally, I would like to uh, to see uh, either the uh, the on-axis response and the responses at varying angles uh, around the microphone, or uh, the on-axis response and polar charts of uh the the microphone and it's just, it's basically the same data uh, uh, presented in different ways but sometimes you can get more useful information out of looking at one picture looking at the polars and sometimes you can get more useful information by looking at uh you know overlaid response uh charts you know on axis and then moving off axis and the let's say with a cardioid microphone you want the ideally the 180 degrees to be way down yeah, and no, yeah, uniform and and no, uniformly down from the uh, from the on axis uh, uh, response and uh, that's uh, not uh, uh, you know some microphones um, have uh, you know distinct colorations and um, you know for let me just. Let me just see if I can quickly. Uh, you can. You got. I, I'm looking up something that you could. You could find if you, if you went to uh, uh, superlux.us and then clicked on the recording microphone link, then clicked on the link for the CMH8C. Uh, that is a three pattern, uh, microphone, um, doesn't, not physically, but uh, performance wise, similar to, um, a, uh, a U87. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So it's and, able to uh, emulate the sound of a U87. Yes, it, it does. It does. It comes pretty doggone close and in all three patterns, which is interesting. Hmm. But uh, if you were to click on the uh, on, a, on the website, I have the responses for each of the three patterns of this of this microphone. So if you click on the uh, the cardioid one, uh, you would see um, uh, and maybe you can cut this in. I will. Uh, when you yeah, uh, you you'd see that there's a, a white curve, which isn't flat, but you know has some distinct ripples in it and and bumps and and so on, and then you have a yellow curve which is the ninety degrees, and that sort of parallels the on-axis response up to you know maybe eight kil eight or nine kilohertz, and there at, uh, above that it it starts dropping off. And but then the vocal frequencies, the fundamental voice frequencies themselves cut off around 4K. And so at that point, you're talking about overtones and harmonics. So And again, this is this is at 90 degrees. Right. This is not the on axis. This is the 90 degree uh, response. But the basic and idea behind a microphone is because it is mono, it's one signal coming through there. It is a sum of everything around it and how that microphone pick up, picks up 
all the different sounds around it. So I, I fully like what y'all are doing there with regards to that. Yeah, and and then there's a uh, a uh, violet curve, which is the 180 response, uh, and that one has a uh, rejection in the say the one to two kilohertz range, uh, probably uh, um, 30 dB. Uh, excuse me. That is, uh, you know, 15, yeah, that's 15 dB down from the on axis. And then below one kilohertz, it rises somewhat and gets, so it's only about 10 dB down. But then going above two kilohertz on up, it actually uh, approaches, uh, and by the time you hit like six kilohertz, it is the same as the 90 degree response. And then when you go above nine kilohertz, it's actually higher response at the 180 point than that microphone is at 90 degrees. Which is interesting, being that it's a cardioid. Yeah, and and it's and let's say it's it's a cardioid at mid frequencies, <laughs> and uh, and it, and it is not at uh, at at other frequencies. And by mm. the way, again, if you were to look at a U87. It, you know, there's a lot of the, the fine details that are different, but the same basic shape of the curves would be the same on a, on a U87. So now, it's basically similarly matching the U87 frequency response curve. Is that what you're saying? But it's... Yes. Okay, so it's similar, but there are differences? Yes, yes there, there, there's, there's, there's differences. It's not an exact copy of a U87 uh, in the response, but it, it is... Uh, definitely similar shapes, uh, shaped response curve. Again, not just on axis, but at 90 and 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the this the combination of the le the not perfectly flat response on axis with what what the microphone is doing at other angles. And here we've got traces for. 90 and 180 degrees, that com all combines to become the unique sound of this of this microphone in use. So this you microphone know, that you're talking about having tested, it shows three different, I guess you can almost call them frequency responses that are then summed together. Is that the idea? Yes, and, and of course, uh, we're, we're sampling just three points. Right. Uh, obviously, <clears throat> it, it, it has all the way around the microphone, um, uh, you know different responses, but uh, here we're we're just we're just sampling three points, and uh, you know now the uh, if we go back and look at the the omni uh, response, uh, we find that the front and back are almost identical, but the ninety degrees has a very distinct high frequency roll off. Mm. And this is you this you will find with any large diaphragm microphone. And let me guess because why. Because it go ahead. Okay. I was going to say I the, guess it's because the diaphragm is facing this way and frequencies are more directional. The higher the frequency is it's more directional. Yeah. So therefore yeah, if, that's, if you're talking if that's in the, the side if of it that's if if that's the uh, the diaphragm diameter and you have a sound coming right at it or coming at it this way, it's hitting the entire face of the diaphragm at the same time. But if you have a, so a sound that's traveling crosswise across the, the face of that diaphragm, it takes time for it to travel across the one inch diameter of the diaphragm and therefore uh, it cancels out because of the, the physical wavelength of the sound. And also, I'm guessing that the higher frequencies of your voice, the ones that are being canceled out, are hitting both the front and the back of the diaphragm. So it's, it's so I guess you could almost say like in a bin binaural type uh, pattern, if you were to talk at that angle, they would cancel each other out because of the positive and negative globes. Is that kind of the general idea? Well, uh, yeah, the, 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 
the the point is, as I say, that you have um, a when when the microphone diaphragm is physically large next to the wavelength of the sound, then uh, sounds that are that are that are a grazing incidence across the front of the diaphragm are going to have a high frequency roll off. Mm. So in other words, if you took this microphone set for Omni, face the front toward you, you'd get one response. Face the rear toward you, you'd get exactly the same as the front response. But if you turned it at 90 degrees, you would lose highs. And that is just, that is, that is true of any large diaphragm microphone just because of the physics uh, gotcha. of it. And uh, so anyway, this, this, this omni response curve uh, set shows that. And then there's a bidirectional set where uh, the uh, front and rear again trace each other pretty much exactly. And the rear uh, response, I, excuse me, the 90 degree response right. Is so far down that it only barely touches the bottom of my of my plot uh, at uh, at two frequencies. Mm. In other words, it, it has a really fabulous a lot of rejection. You know, better better than twenty five dB uh, rejection of sounds coming from the side. And uh, so the the that side rejection of a figure eight microphone is vastly better than the rear rejection of, uh, of any cardioid microphone. So let me ask you this then. If we're talking about just cardioid pattern, because that's what we would basically, we would use that more in voiceover or in the film industry with regards to our microphones picking up voices. If we are talking yeah. about microphones from that perspective, what is it that makes the signature sound of a microphone microphone? Is it just the frequency response or is it a combination of the frequency response and all the other specs? Or is there something totally that we haven't gotten into? Well, yeah, it, it, specifications don't necessarily tell you everything. You know, for example, the old U87 microphones had a transformer-based electronics in them. The current production U87 microphones have a transformer-less uh, uh, circuitry, and the fact that there is not a transformer in there uh, makes a difference in the sound. And so the old U87s, which by the way, this Superlux I'm mentioning, has a circuitry very similar to the old one with, a, with an output transformer. Uh, they sound maybe not dramatically different, but they do sound different than the modern production ones with uh, a transformer-less uh, circuit. And and so the, yeah, there's a lot of little little uh, little subtleties uh, to things. And as I say. That particular one, I wouldn't know what to tell you to look for on a data sheet that would show that, you know, that there's that difference in sound. But if you listen to them, you'll tell. So when you look at them and you look at their specifications, there's nothing really that tells you they would sound similar based on the specs, frequency response, polar pattern. There's nothing really that indicates you would actually have to listen to it. Well, okay. Uh, I, I'm talking about the difference between the active and the, and the transformer-based uh circuit in gotcha. the thing. but you you can look at uh a detailed response curve set of uh a u87 for example and uh compare it against the uh the cmhhc and they're quite similar they're not identical but they are quite similar in the res in the response curves and if you listen to them they're again, they're they're fairly similar sounding, not exactly, but they they they're definitely similar sounding. So, so if it was it, identical, would it therefore sound identical, or is that still? The, the, again, it I guess it depends upon the you know. It's like people say that uh, for uh, 
uh, you know, uh, uh, 90 percent of the cost uh, goes into ten percent of the uh, uh, of the results. You know, yeah. uh, so uh, you, uh, you know, how identical are the measurements, and how identical are uh, uh, is is the sound, uh, and uh, but you can you can definitely say there there are things that are that are similar. Now, things that are easier to uh, to tell would be things like the noise floor. Uh, you know, it, so if you're trying to record something very soft, so you want a microphone with a very low uh, uh, inherent noise, uh, then uh, that that is a good specification to look at. Uh, on the other hand, if you are trying to record very loud sounds, the um, maximum SPL that the microphone can take is is a very important thing to look at, and the specification sheet will definitely give you good guidance there. Now, one of the things that um, some manufacturers tell you more about than other manufacturers, and also it depends upon the, the which microphone in the line, but um, Sure, in particular, for some of their nicer recording microphones, will tell you what the maximum SPL is for different load impedances on the microphone. Gotcha. In other words, if it's if it's a thousand ohm load or a two thousand ohm load or a five thousand ohm load, um, what is the max uh, uh, SPL? And they're not the same. The higher the impedance, generally, the the uh, higher max SPL is before you you start getting distortion. Uh, and uh, uh, this this can be uh, um, a, a thing to consider if you're trying to get really loud sounds captured without distortion. And um, so it could be somebody screaming into the microphone or or whatever you know some percussive sound that's 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 very loud and you're and if you're trying to capture that cleanly uh you you know definitely want to look at at, at this now if some people will say oh well let's just go and uh, uh buy uh, you know one of these little inline pads you know a 15 db or 20 db inline pad and put it between the microphone and the preamp, and that will extend uh, my 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 range. Well, not necessarily. The uh, problem with that is that the uh, those pads are often 150 ohm input and output impedance, and condenser microphones in particular their maximum SPL goes way down once you get below about a thousand ohm load on them. Gotcha. So you, you put a, you put a 15 dB pad that's of the 150 ohm or 250 ohm style between the microphone and the, and the preamp. And you might actually make things worse, not better. Interesting. So let's talk yeah. a little bit about the actual measurement measuring process of microphones. What is the general consistent? Con, if you were testing a microphone, what would you do? Okay. Uh, first thing, I need a uh, a space to do the testing in, and uh, this could be an anechoic chamber. In other words, something that absorbs all the sounds that hit the walls of the thing and don't bounce back in and contaminate the measurements. Or I could be using a test method or software package that allows me to ignore the reflections from the surfaces of the test chamber. Interesting. And uh, so the, the, the first me uh, method for doing this that came out was the the TEF and uh, time energy frequency uh, analyzer invented by Dick Heiser and uh, but today there's a lot of 
other uh, methods that'll do effectively the same thing. And uh, today, the, the what you would do is capture an impulse response. Then, if you look look at the impulse response, the um, the you start at time zero, and this is going increasing time, and it, it's very low, and then all of a sudden, boom! There's a big spike. That's the the sound arriving at the microphone, and then it it falls off, and then there's various jags and stuff as it bounces come back from the room around it. Mm -hmm. And if you then uh, do what they call a window on this that lets the sound, the direct sound through, but cuts off the the sounds that arrived earlier or, or later, which primarily you're concerned about later because earlier there's, there's usually nothing but noise. But uh, that allows you to have let's say a virtual anechoic chamber uh, in an ordinary room and so what you need is a room that is big enough uh, to do uh, uh, low frequency uh, uh, measurements down to the frequency that you might want to use uh, when I when I built my garage I uh, built it as high as I could get away with, with the, the town would allow me. And, uh, uh, so I have, oh, um, about, I think it's 16 feet to the, to the peak of this and in the area I'm using for, for microphone measurements. And then if I can keep things away all around and I position the microphone uh, and the test loudspeaker at about eight foot off the ground, so it's halfway there, and so the bounces off the floor, the bounces off the off the the ceiling, uh, would be coming in at all about the same amount of time. Then I use, as I say, the TEF, and it allows me to narrow in on just that direct sound, and ignore the the room reflections. And again, this this is a, a technique uh, in various iterations of how it's exactly done software-wise, but that uh, many manufacturers uh, uh, use some variation on this on this basic idea, uh, so they don't have to physically have a, an anechoic chamber; they just need a big room. And of course, uh, you would need now, a, some sort of a calibration microphone that is completely flat, a measurement microphone, yes? Yes. Well, okay, we're, we'll, we'll get there. The so first thing you need is this big space. And with this 16-foot ceiling, I can get down to about 50 hertz. And so I cannot produce any usable measurements, you know, below 50 hertz. So from 50 hertz on up as high as we want to go, this this space will work. So then the the next thing you need is, as you said, a reference microphone. And so um, the uh, you can buy microphone capsules uh, from companies such as Brule and Care, which is probably the most famous such in the world, or a ACO. Uh, which uh, is the ones that I primarily use, and uh, but also from companies like Grass, uh, GRAS, and and a few others that make uh, really good precision uh, capsules. And um, if you want to know what this capsule is doing, you take it and you send it to the uh, to NIST, the National Institutes of Science and Technology, and they will calibrate your your microphone for you. And uh, so to get that calibrated out to 20 kilohertz, plus or minus three-tenths of a dB, costs you roughly 10 grand. Ah. Huh. Yeah. So... Not having ten grand to to throw at at that, uh, I uh, uh, 
uh, got a chance to get a hold of an entire production run of capsules out of uh, uh, ACO that they had measured in a, with a methodology very similar to what NIST uses. And I was looking for two, two capsules that would be as close as possible to exactly the same frequency response and as close as possible to dead flat. And so I, I found those two capsules out of the batch of 100 and bought them from them. Let me ask you real quick. How much fluctuation and deviation is there from perfectly flat? Or I guess this, this pertains to any microphone in general. When they post a frequency response, it can be plus or minus how many dB? Like how many on, on a high price, really high, high quality reference microphone, you would expect it to be more, you would expect it to be very flat. So yeah, and, and again, I can, uh, I'll get you uh, um, the tolerance curves for what they call a type one and then a type two uh, microphone. Type one is, uh, you know, your precision and your, and your type two is like, you know, you sort of your field use uh, uh, tolerance limits. But uh, they, let's say they widen up quite a bit more than you might think, particularly at the very low and very high frequencies. And uh, as in dB, several dB, opening uh, in what the response could be. And that's plus or uh, minus. So it basically, if it's, for example, plus or minus 3 dB, on one microphone it could be plus 3 dB, and on another one it could be minus 3 dB, that's a difference of 6 dB. Well, uh, possibly, uh, though the, the tolerances are not, the plus and the minus tolerance are not the same. And, and so you might have a plus one and a half and a minus five allowed at, wow. you know, say 20 kilohertz. And uh, so, uh, and again, I, I will, I will scoot you uh, copies of the, uh, uh, of some, 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 the, the tolerance curves from the standards. Yes. And I'd love uh, to see them. yeah. So anyway, uh, that's, so I got these two, two, two capsules, and then in my test lab, I compared them with each other, and they agreed to be within a quarter dB of each other over from as low as I could measure out to 20 kilohertz. And uh, so I said, okay, that's good enough for me. <laughs> and uh, then I stuck one of them away, and I, and I don't use it, and then I have the other one, that is my my working reference, and uh, so so that's one thing. Getting a microphone that you can trust as a reference, and then the next thing is you need a uh, coaxial loudspeaker. And the reason you need to be a coaxial is if you have a loudspeaker with a with a woofer and a and a and a tweeter they're at different points in space. And so whatever distance away you are measuring from, obviously really tiny differences in the position of the microphone are going to make a difference in the time of arrival of the woofer and the tweeter signals and mess up your, your measurements. Gotcha. So you really want to have a, uh, have a coaxial loudspeaker and then uh, measure. Uh, that way your exact positioning of the microphone you're testing becomes much less critical. Now, but the loudspeaker is not going to be flat. That's just a given. And so uh, what you do is you measure the uh, location uh, at a given point in space. You put your, your, your uh, reference microphone there you measure the response of the loudspeaker. And then you take the reference microphone out of that point, uh, put the uh, microphone you're going to test in exact same point in space, and take another measurement. And now that measurement has both the loudspeaker's response and the microphone's response superimposed. 
But since we know what the response of the loudspeaker by itself is, because we have captured that with a with the reference microphone, mm-hmm. we can now subtract the one from the other. Gotcha. And get just the response of the uh, microphone we're testing. Now, there's a lot of little details in in making this 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 work uh, well in the in the real world, and it it can take you some time to work out all all of the details to to get consistent results. Um, I mean, anybody can get a do this and do a, get a measurement, but is it is it right or you know if you measured it again, would you get the same results? Right. Is, is the real is the real question. And so what I try to do is, uh, you know, put up the reference microphone, then put up in sequence a bunch of different microphones that I'm testing, and then put the reference microphone back up. And if the second pass with the reference microphone exactly zeroes out with the first pass, then my test setup has stayed stable. Gotcha. Over, over the... Uh, uh, the the period of time that I've be, been trying to do this, and things like um, air currents, um, things like the the microphone st- or and or loudspeaker stand has shifted because of temperature changes, and has moved a couple of thousandths of an inch. Mm. And you know, we'll I have noticed sometimes whenever I'm booming. I have noticed that some some buildings that I'm in, the pressure is higher. Even though it feels like I don't feel anything different on my skin, the microphone will be more sensitive even using the same gear than it is at other times simply because of the pressure in the air. And I may have to use a different windscreen accordingly. Well, okay, yeah, that's another that's another whole thing. Uh, I know they're, they, one of the things they've been, uh, been struggling with, and I don't know that they've come to any conclusion conclusion but how do you measure the wind sensitivity of a microphone and uh, that's one of the things the AES has been been struggling with so in other words in a, or you could say how effective is a given windscreen on a given microphone and uh, that is not the easiest thing in the world to 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 measure in any consistent way now you could test and, it I guess for acoustic transparency that's pretty easy I would assume Oh yes, yeah. That that is because again, you 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 have a, a a test set up, and then you throw your windscreen on, and you measure it, and you compare the two measurements, and that's what the windscreen did. Right. You know. So yes. So you you can you can you can look at uh, at that fairly easily, and uh, the uh, that's why you know the. Some microphones, uh, particularly like vocal microphones, will be made with a foam windscreen inside the ball head of the microphone. Mm-hmm. And uh, then there's there's others that that try to do um, probably better called a pop filter um, that is multiple layers of uh, uh, gauze or perforated material uh, and no foam. And one of the reasons that that technique is used is that you don't lose as much highs through through the foam. And uh, so that that's an, that's another whole uh, uh, another whole thing. Uh, I know that uh, for people who are trying to do uh, noise measurements out outdoors with with measurement microphones and you know have have wind uh, issues. Uh, the uh, uh, the the companies that make the uh, the microphone capsules also make special windscreens, and uh, you know, for example, it's sort of typical. You might find a, a four-inch windscreen foam sphere, basically, uh, that has some high high-end roll-off, but not too bad. But at some wind point, it, it's it's going to let too much wind through. And so then there's another one that is a seven inch uh, diameter version of it that that rolls off more highs, but which uh, 
keeps the, the noise down with a considerably higher amount of wind uh, blowing right. across the, the microphone. And so, I mean, those, those are the sorts of, of, of trade-offs that you uh, can get into. So let me ask there. you this. Uh, what kind of, I'm sorry to interrupt, what kind of smoothing is acceptable with regards to, the, with, with regards to microphone testing? Do you find that some microphone manufacturers smooth more so than others or, and maybe even try to, like especially on more inexpensive microphones where they're trying to maybe make a certain point, uh, they will smooth maybe more on a cheaper microphone than they would a higher price microphone? Well, I, I think that a lot of manufacturers will take a uh, measurement uh, of the microphone and then uh, take, um, you know, the, so your basic artist tools, you know, your curves and, and, and uh, drafting curves and, and things like this and sort of manually make an approximation of that curve that is nice and smooth instead of jaggedy. And the, there, there is a certain amount of jaggediness that, you, that you're going to get in uh, uh, measurements uh, just uh, by the nature of, you know, things are less than perfectly precise, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, again, how, how, how accurate are you trying to get? Uh, for example, um, I found that if if I'm going to get the best accuracy and need the least amount of smoothing, uh, I need to have sound going through that loudspeaker at all times. So in between my test, I need to be running some big noise through that loudspeaker at the same level as my test signal would be. Uh, just to keep the the loudspeaker, we say, limbered up. Mm. Uh, and and if I don't do that, if I if I take a uh, a response and then just not put no no signal through the loudspeaker, and then a minute or two later take another response, they might not be the the same. And then if I if I start taking them as fast as I can response and then as soon as that's done take another one as soon as that's done take another one and so on then i see a drift in the in the overall shape of the of the response curves that i'm Ooh, getting as the, as the as the loudspeaker warms up should we say yeah and uh, so uh you know there's there's little little subtleties like that plus as a you know they, they there's no perfectly uh, you know, even with doing everything we have, there's going to be some little jaggedies in there that are probably not in the actual response of the microphone, but are just aberrations of our of our test setup being less than perfect and a loudspeaker being less than perfectly repeatable from sweep to sweep, even doing everything we can to uh, to get things uh, as good as we can. What I what what I will often do is um, apply uh, a one third octave smoothing to things, and that um, that makes it a lot less critical. And if I if I was trying to do do response curves without smoothing, and and many of the ones on my website were done. Uh, without any without any smoothing uh, and if you look at the strictly the high end uh, response there's fine little jaggedinesses to the to the curve and those jaggedies are you know you, you could argue whether they're really there or not mm -hmm. or if it's just aberrations of how the testing was done I guess the, equ the so equivalent of some amount of yeah yeah so so the uh, uh, there, there is an argument for having some amount of, of, of smoothing, but, uh, you know, if you, if you go and it also probably, uh, like when I'm measuring, uh, uh, reference microphones, 
which are by themselves pretty dug on smooth and, and flat. Uh, and so there's not a not big differences in the response. I mean, these are microphones that are going to be within a you know say a two dB spread out to twenty kilohertz, and uh, so there I can justify using a third octave smoothing better than maybe some microphone which had bigger swings in the response, which I want to capture in my measurement without. Uh, blurring some of those those details, mm -hmm. um, you know. But with the with the with the me with the measurement microphones, which are pretty much flat anyway, you know. As I say, I can say, okay, anything that is being taken out by the third octave smoothing is mostly you it's probably know, not that interesting. At one and it's aberrations of of the testing, and it's and it's something that I won't get if I. And, you know the, those fine little details will be different every time I do uh, the this run. Right. And so there, there's a certain uh, things to be said if you smooth enough to be able to get consistent results from your test setup. So from and so whether that's one tenth of a dB or one third of a dB, that's probably the range. Of uh, uh, I mean one tenth of an octave versus one third of an octave, that's probably the range that uh, makes sense. Much more than a third of an octave, you're going to a half an octave to an octave smoothing. You're 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 hiding stuff that you you want you want to be able to see because you're going to hear it. Now I'm I'm just guessing here because from having listened to a lot of microphones myself and then looking at the frequency response, it looks to me like some of them are smoother in the response than they are sounding to my ear. They sound to me like they would be more drastic. And now from my own experimentations with regards to smoothing, it looks to me like you can take some pretty drastic differences in like highs and lows if it's really, really crazy and jagged and up and down. A simple smoothing is all it takes to make it sound a lot more tame than it really is. Or, or look, you mean on the, on a printed, right? Uh, more tame than it, than it is. It makes it look yes. exactly. Yes, and and uh, uh, so that uh, uh, that that article that I uh, wrote that you saw uh, that talked about smoothing. I mean, that was an actual microphone response there, shown all different ways. You know, and 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 so there's a, there's a difference in both the uh, octave smoothing, but there's also the difference in uh, what the what the dB range is from top to bottom of the chart. You know, and so if you have a, uh, for example, for my reference microphones, I use a scale of 10 dB from top to, top to bottom of the of the page. You know, or say plus or minus five, mm -hmm. and uh, that's because these microphones are supposed to be dead flat or close to, and so I I want to emphasize any minor aberrations that are there. Right. In in the plot. Essentially uh, blowing it up because it, you don't need as yes. much drastic. You said plus or minus two is typically what is acceptable. Yeah, and uh, so. Uh, then, uh, uh, for, so we say recording microphones, uh, or PA microphones, it, it might be, uh, you know, you might want to do a 30 dB top to bottom, uh, of the chart. That much. Or okay. even 40 dB. Uh, yeah. And, uh, so... Uh, and I, I've actually learned, I, I, I can't quote it to you off the top of my head, but there, uh, there is an international standard which gives a two or three choices of um, uh, the, 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 the scaling. And uh, basically they go, say, you know, you take a decade, say 1,000 hertz to 10 kilohertz, and that dimension, spin it this way, could be 30 dB or it could be 50 dB uh, on the on the vertical for that same dimension, and that makes it easier to compare 
response plots. You know, if because if you if you you know that way, because you can obviously stretch things out. You can make a a plot that's very wide, and but not very high physically. And uh, you know, so if you if you make them in these in these two consistent things, where that uh, that that decade range in the frequency is either 30 or 50 dB in the amplitude, that same distance, <clears throat> that makes for easier comparisons from one chart to another. Now you said 30 dB. That's mean. That means like plus and minus 15 dB. Yes. Yes. That seems to be a very that seems to be a very drastic amount of potential change with regards to microphone measurements. Like a microphone, as they usually post on the frequency response, is only plus or minus maybe as a general rule up to six. Or maybe they try not to go much more than about five to eight as a general rule. Um, from this well, okay, let, let, let's let's put it this way. Um, that Going back to that, that U87-like uh, microphone in cardioid, mm -hmm. Uh, and those curves are plotted on a <laughs> plus or minus 15 dB scale. Okay. The 30 dB top to bottom. And they are scaled such that the on-axis response at the very peak of the response, which is at around 12 kilohertz, is just about touching the top of that plus 15 uh, range. Now, when you get down to... The one to two kilohertz, it, it's at plus ten, and uh, then uh, if you go uh, above oh, about sixteen kilohertz, it, it's starting to drop off below plus ten, and uh, by the time you get to twenty kilohertz, it's just a little below zero. Gotcha. Okay, so that's that's the on-axis response, the most sensitive direction. If you then take the 90 degree curve that is through much of the range is hovering right around the 5 dB mark on that scale but then once you get above about 9 kilohertz it starts dropping off and it hits minus 15 at around 16 kilohertz hmm. and, and just falls off the bottom of the of the chart and uh, then the, the 180 degree curve, the low frequencies are right around at zero. The mid range is around minus five. Then it, then it shoots up from there and peaks at around uh, you know, 12 kilohertz and then dives sharply thereafter. And again, it falls off the bottom of the chart at around 18 kilohertz. And so even with uh, a chart that is 30 dB top to bottom, if you wanted to plot those three curves, the on-axis, 90 degree, and 180 degree, uh, at the extreme highs, uh, the everything but the on-axis is falling off the bottom of the chart, uh, even, even with a 30 dB spread from top to bottom. So let me ask you this. One of my friends had recently tested on his YouTube channel two microphones from the same manufacturer that sound very different, but they have an identical frequency response. What would you say is the reasoning or could be the reasoning for something like that? Well, okay. If they're different models, I assume? Correct. Okay. Then um, they you could have very similar on-axis response, but the off-axis response, you know, like the 90 and 180, but everything else in between is probably quite different uh, with, with, those, uh, with those two microphones. And so since we're not using them generally in an anechoic chamber, we're using them in a real room, there's you know, the, the sound comes in on axis, but also it bounces off the room surfaces and comes in uh, at all these different responses at the different angles off axis. Hmm. And so that 
winds up being a uh, a reason why you cannot uh, uh, why you can get two two microphones that if you're only looking at the on axis response, which is what uh, most microphone manufacturers post, right? Uh, if you're only looking at that on axis response, they 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 look similar, but they actually sound different because of all of the off-axis responses, which are not uh, the, the same. And this is the, also the reason why um, the sort of the fallacy behind microphone modeling, which is, you know, these DSP processors that say, oh, take your SM58 and we'll make it sound like a U87 for you. Right. You know, and uh, they could, assuming that they're doing that they have good measurements of the of the two microphones in question, and assuming that the SM58 you are using has the same response as the SM58 that they tested for doing their building air mic modeling, um, that's still only comparing the on-axis responses. And that's so you can make the on-axis of that SM58 as processed by this box, similar to the on-axis response of that U87, but the off-axis responses will be totally different. So that's why the net results are disappointing, let's say. And that's only you're just never, the frequency response itself. The rest of the microphone, I mean, you're talking about a dynamic versus a condenser. You're talking about something right. that has totally, like, it's a completely passive micro microphone versus a powered 48 volt phantom power microphone the specs best the other specifications are totally different so even if you match the frequency response correct me if i'm wrong but those microphones would still sound very much different well okay yeah and, and you you have uh, you know the uh, you know it's it's the impulse response of the microphone the you know how, how it handles transients uh there's there's the the, the noise the, the no the noise the noise floor uh uh, issues and you know uh, the the diaphragm diameter of the SM58 is considerably smaller than that larger diameter uh, uh, U87 capsule, mm -hmm. which has a, about a one inch uh, diaphragm in terms of the working area of the diaphragm, though it's actually physically bigger than that, and so. That means that, as you say, when you have this grazing sound that goes across the front, you know, the U87, like any large diaphragm, is going to uh, uh, have a high high end roll up to grazing sounds, whereas the the SM58 is, is not going to have that effect uh, to the same degree anyway, because it's a much smaller uh, diameter microphone. Now you, you go you go even further you know you get a a, a little uh, a microphone like this and uh, again the the diaphragm is so small that the difference in response for an omni between on axis into the microphone and, and at 90 degrees is not going to be that great uh, uh, because. The, sti the diameter of that capsule is so small. But yet you could still visually match them if you use this software. Is yes, what... I mean, these, these mic modeling uh, uh, software is <laughs> that, that uh, you know, as I say, claim that you can make, you know, any microphone sound like any other microphone. <laughs> Which, well... of course, that sounds kind of like voodoo to me because I don't believe there is, if, if you tried even telling me that if I agreed with you and you'd pay me a million do billion dollars to believe you, if, if you can make <laughs> the microphone on your face right now on your headset sound like a U87, I would say I cannot agree with you. I'd be out the million dollars because I, I cannot, yeah. I can't get that around my head. It doesn't, to me, to me, it's not about matching frequency response. It's about, there's so many other factors of the microphone that oh, you yeah, really need to consider. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and again, the, the, it's also the uh, the consistency. I mean, uh, Neumann is you know a good quality manufacturer, and they they make 
you know, very consistent uh, product. And uh, the uh, consistency from sample to sample of something that is cheap enough to get put in this headset is not going to be anywhere near as, as good. Plus, there's all sorts of other things. It's like the the uh, the U87 and, and and everything from its capsule design through its electronics is designed to be as linear with level. In other words, not change its characteristics as the level changes as they can manage to do. Yeah, they spend a lot and, of money on that engineering too, and you end up paying for it. Oh yeah, they end oh, up yeah. um, and their quality standards. If they're not happy with the way that a diaphragm or even as much as a little board, if they're not happy with the way that it is to its exact specifications, they'll scrap it and start over again because they're not about to give you something that they cannot fully trust to be the way they make it. They're they're making it within their quality guidelines. Yeah, and and the the shift over from microphones to 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 loudspeakers. Uh, one of the one of the companies that has. A really good reputation in loudspeakers is Meyer Sound. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, uh, unlike most loudspeaker manufacturers, at least most smaller loudspeaker manufacturers, Meyer Sound actually builds all their own drivers. Right. Uh, they, they don't. They don't buy them. And uh, if you if you go through their uh, their place, they have all their production uh, equipment and. You know, they got to have everything just tweaked, just, oh, yes. just right. And then everything, every driver is is measured uh, as it, it comes off the, the line to be within a certain tolerance of uh, what they expect. But then every driver goes into a test room with the gold reference original driver of that type side by side and a human listens to program material through them and says okay we've done all our testing we've done all the measurements we can now we're going to listen to see if if they if they if they sound the same because there's only so much that specifications can tell you when you're dealing with something like hearing i'm guessing yeah yeah and and you know the the ultimate thing is you know how does it sound you know, so uh, that that's just that's just the way things are. So, all right. So let me ask you this: If we're talking specifically about an inexpensive microphone versus a more expensive microphone by a manufacturer that we know, let's just say, uh, let's say Rode or AKG or any company really in general. They make a more expen uh, a more expensive line, and then they make a lesser expensive line. At least many manufacturers do. So their entry level microphones are those adhering to the same quality standards as the higher uh, micro higher price microphones with regards to their measurement, uh, how they measure the microphones. Like for example, if I put a two hundred dollar microphone against a two thousand dollar microphone from the same manufacturer. Are they going to be using the same smoothing? Are they going to be using the same testing methods? Or are they going to be varying a bit? Don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, you, you mentioned uh, AKG, and uh, uh, I, I had been talking about the, the, this one particular Superlux uh, microphone just because it was a uh, had some some good dramatic changes in the response at different angles right um but if uh, that superlux is a brand name of guang fang out of taiwan hmm. okay. which also makes the low end large diaphragm microphones for akg and of course they're making those to akg specifications not, you know, so what you're buying from, I wouldn't say you're going to buy a Superlux and get the same uh, response or or whatever uh, testing or, or quality controlled as the inexpensive large diaphragms from, from, from AKG, but they are coming out of the same factory. So their and source, their source diaphragms are the same essentially. 
if I'm an engineering uh, point of view. Well, they they. The, the they're, they're coming from the same production uh, facility. Whether you know what the what the differences are in the diaphragm and in some of the fine details, it's 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 hard to say. I, I mean, I don't I don't know. But uh, uh, the uh, one of one of the interesting things with uh, there are so many amazingly good for the money microphones coming out of China. There's of course a lot of junk, yeah. but there's also some amazingly amazingly good microphones for the money uh, coming out. And uh, this came out of the uh, the cold the Cold War and at the end of World War II when uh, uh, Germany was divided in half and Neumann headquarters was in West Germany. But the and design facility was in West Germany. Wow! But the production plant was in East Germany. Wow! And the um, uh, so those East East German uh, Neumann uh, information uh, the the Russians who were controlling East Germany. Of course, grabbed all the information and actually didn't make a whole lot of it, uh, uh, use of it themselves, but passed it on to the Chinese, who at the time were their buddies. Mm -hmm. And so that's why you you find uh, a lot of. Um, Chinese made microphones with, shall we say, at least similar technology to what uh, Neumann had had developed. Gotcha. Because they were they were making them uh, for the uh, for the communist bloc countries. So it's not being reverse engineered. It came from the the same specifications, basically, and they're just engineering yeah, they, it they, their own way, or producing yeah. it their own way. Right, and uh, so, uh, but the uh, uh, you know it, it was it was just sort of the uh, uh, other microphones of of cheaper sorts. They didn't have such a a great reference to go by, and uh, so the cheap, you know, the really cheapy Chinese-made microphones. Some of them were pretty awful bad, but uh, on the on the on the high end. Uh, the the Chinese uh, actually had been for quite a number of years now making some really fine uh, uh, recording grade uh, microphones because they were starting off from uh, the, all of the factory production data uh, and uh, uh, how the machines were, were were made to make all the parts for the microphones and so on out of uh, 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 Neumann, and gotcha. by the way, that that now that the Germany was reunited, uh, the East German Neumann is sold as Microtech Gefell. That is that East German Neumann plant. Hmm. So when, when you when you see a a Gefell uh, or a Microtech Gefell uh, microphone. That is coming out of what was the the East German production plant for Neumann. And that's probably the reason why they use very similar, like if, for example, you can run into some RF issues because of the casing of a Gefell or a Neumann microphone, and then if you simply ground tie the casing to the pin, to pin one to the ground, it eliminates that because they're very similarly designed. They're the yes. two of the microphone yeah. manufacturers that are similarly designed from that point of view. And it's a fix that works yes. well for both of them. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's, it's sort of interesting that uh, uh, Neumann um, uh, did not continue. Uh, before the split of the country, uh, Neumann made uh, uh, some precision measurement microphones. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, after 
the the split, uh, Neumann sort of walked away from that market, but Cafel uh, stayed in it. And so today you can buy uh, uh, here in the U.S. Uh, off of Josephson, you can buy uh, uh, you know some really really fine precision uh, reference microphones made by made by Cafel. And I'm guessing also that because so many Chinese companies have been doing this now for decades, that's one of the reasons why when they remove their ironclad, like maybe a tenth of a percentage deviation standard from manufacturing one diaphragm or one component to another, if they are less stringent with regards to that, that makes a passable microphone component that they could easily put into one of the more inexpensive microphones that we, when we see like a microphone that's twenty dollars and it comes with a shock mount and a cable and a windscreen and all that kind of stuff is that am i on the right path with regards to this i i i think you are and uh uh again uh you know some uh some of the uh, the chinese made uh, uh microphones are uh, you know, quite quite decent and even pretty consistent, sample to sample. Um, but uh, others others are not, and uh, so it's. Uh, uh, but uh, that's that's you know they have such a low cost of labor. Of course, that that difference has been getting less and less through the years. But they certainly started off with a hugely Difference cost of labor between, you know, West Germany and uh, you know uh, uh, some place in in in, uh, in China. Right. That uh, uh, it uh, that was the other reason they could they could make stuff uh, even without making it you know say cheaper. Uh, they, you know they they can wind up with a lower selling price just because the labor cost was so low. Gotcha. So. so let me ask you this, to, to kind of bring this full circle. If I were to look at two different microphones that are considered to be a matching pair versus a microphone that is from, from a line, uh, from, from a, a particular, two different random microphones that are the exact same microphone. If I ordered, for example, two off of Amazon or I bought two from my local sound vendor, those are not necessarily going to be matching pairs. Those could, those could sound very much different. Mm -hmm. So how is it then that two microphones that are technically the same model, that are the same manufacturer, how is it that they can sound so drastically different and yet still be the same microphone? How does that work? Well, uh, I, I wonder if you went and actually measured this, those two supposedly identical microphones, you know, whether you would, you would get, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the same curves of the actual microphones as opposed to, should we say, the published curves, which are probably from first production samples or something like that, or prototypes. Um, so th there, there's one whole possibility for differences. Um, I would say that if you had two microphones that the response curves were very, very close, they should probably sound close to the, the same, uh, at least to a first pass. It's not that you wouldn't be able to you know, listen for some of the finer details and so on and, 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 and tell the two microphones apart. But at first plus, they should be, you know, at least, you know, pretty much, uh, the same, uh, sort of, sort of sound. Mm -hmm. Uh, now if you put, if you took the two microphones, you, uh, put them next to each other, you put them on your headphones with one, one microphone on each, on each ear, you know, so that you're getting that differential thing in in your brain. Uh, then you can tell some really subtle differences uh, between between the pair, and uh, you know that'll probably allow you to to detect uh, differences which 
you would never detect. You wouldn't detect in a nor more normal use conditions. But there's many deviations that typically come with regards to the manufacturing process themselves. They can try to maintain the published frequency response, for example, and maintain the the technical specs that are the uh, the published specs. But they will. They can vary quite a bit just in the manufacturing process themselves, which is why when you go to buy a batching pair of microphones, they actually have to send someone in to pull two different microphones that physically match up very similar. It's not the same as saying, I'm going to grab this one and I'm going to grab the next one in the line. They're going to be the same. Is that correct? No. Yes, that is, that is correct. Um, uh, and I know at one point I was attempting to um, uh, pick matched pairs of uh of microphones and um yeah, i found if i bought a dozen microphones from one batch uh from uh, a a good chinese manufacturer and um i could probably and if my tolerance was that the on-axis response of the microphones of the pair had to match within a dB of each other out to 20 kilohertz. Uh, I could probably get three matched pairs out of a dozen microphones. Mm. Okay. So they're uh, usually fairly close as long as you're coming from a good manufacturer. Now, is that an inexpensive? Or is the, the diaphragms you're talking about, are those fairly inexpensive or are those pretty good quality ones where they put some specifications and, and um i'm talking about a, a, an under 300 dollars microphone gotcha that's good okay. to know actually i'm not talking about a 50 dollars microphone i'm talking about you know a, a pretty pretty decent microphone from uh an inexpensive manufacturer right uh and i'm also talking about not a dozen microphones in random i'm talking about a case of 12 microphones that are consecutive serial numbers that came off the production line. Right, because if they're deviating from, like, let's say, even 300 serial numbers off, that could be a big deviation as the, mecha as yeah. the machines just, they, they might naturally shift just a little bit in the manufacturing process or a component, a screw may come slightly undone over the course of time and it could make a huge difference in the manufacturing. Oh yeah, I mean you know when you consider that the uh, the diaphragms in these in these microphones, uh, the tensioning of those of the of the of that plastic diaphragm is is so is so critical, and uh, you know typical large large diaphragm uh, microphone they start off with a with a plastic sheet and then they have a, a manufacturing jig that tries to pr pr provide exactly the same radial force at all angles around the the circle and then they put the back plate and they put the top part on and then they run in run in a whole bunch of screws around the edge to clamp it all while keeping the tension on it in the manufacturing jig then they cut cut the you know the excess off the outside and that becomes your thing but you know there's, there's a lot of things that that can vary there it can go wrong you know and you're and, talking uh, about very sensitive, a very, very sensitive, uh, you know, oh, yeah. it's, it's extremely sensitive. That diaphragm is very, very sensitive. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, you're, you're talking about, uh, you know, some very, very thin plastic. And how evenly, perfectly uniformly thick is that uh, across the surface? How, how is, the, is the chemistry absolutely exactly the same i mean this is this is a polymer and uh, uh plastics are very complex uh subject i uh while while i was in college i worked for a company uh, that uh, made plastic uh, analysis equipment and it, it, it was just amazing uh how uh you know subtle differences in the production of the of the plastic uh, could could make differences in the in the results and then also temperature wise um, mm. now uh, you know, high end your your better large diaphragm microphones 
if you if you look at the capsule, there's usually these screws around all around the edge of the diaphragm, clamping it. That's a mechanically clamped. Um, some uh, precision uh, measurement capsules, uh, they they actually laser weld the diaphragm in place all around the diameter. But most of your uh, recording microphones, other than the, the, than the large diaphragm type, uh, and your PA microphones and so on, the assembly of that microphone, the, the, the diaphragm into the, the rest of the structure and the magnet structure on a, on, a, on a dynamic, all of that is held in place with glue. Oh. Okay. And I can imagine, I mean, they, so they, therefore I can definitely imagine the temperature playing a factor. I mean, I can imagine even the way that it's handled after it is physically produced if it is not handled exactly right, it could deviate from, from the way the machine manufactured it. I mean, like if, for oh, example, yeah. it's manufactured and it even goes up one degree before it was a, the rest of the microphone was assembled, that could actually make a huge difference. When you're talking yes, about that, and uh, you know, one one thing that um, uh, I again working with uh, precision measurement microphones. Um, until you're getting into the more expensive ones with uh, either clamped or laser welded metal diaphragms like the the ones I use from ACO in, in the measurement microphone I built uh, has a has a thin titanium uh, diaphragm and then the rest of the mechanism is uh, made and machined out of stainless steel and the insulators are quartz and you know so I mean it's in expensive materials that were chosen so they don't have big changes with the with temperature now or humidity go, i'm assuming humidity would play a big factor in as well well that that i'll get to humidity but uh the um so most of our microphones are adhesively assembled okay and so when the, the adhesive will stay pretty consistent until you get a little bit too hot. Mm -hmm. And then the combination of the force of the diaphragm that was being stretched and then glued in place. And the, so there's tension on that diaphragm. And the combination of that diaphragm tension and the, the glues just starting to loosen up can change the tensioning of, of this across the diaphragm so it isn't uniform in all directions. And mm. so you get a, a case that if the microphone once gets over some temperature, which is going to vary from microphone to microphone, depending on which, what glue was used and other materials were used, but there'll be some temperature that if you get over that once, all bets are off on to, in terms of what the response of the microphone is. So that means that if is is it possible then that if I ordered a microphone in the summer and that arrived, if that package is sending inside of a FedEx or UPS or, or US United States Postal Service, if it's sitting too long in that that delivery vehicle, that could actually change the microphone before it even gets to me. Is yes. That so yeah. it could be and, and I know certainly with it with if you're talking talking about you know, precision uh, measurement sort of grade microphones. If you leave the thing in your car in the summer just for a few hours. You've ruined it. You, you don't know what happened. It, you, you might get lucky and it might have not have changed much or, or it might have changed significantly. Mm. Um, uh, I, I think I'd mentioned to you that there was a... Um, uh, and a really inexpensive Chinese made measurement microphone that would sell for 90 bucks that I was just amazed at how good and consistent they were. Um, and until they suddenly weren't, <laughs> but uh, something changed in the production. But, uh, and anyway, uh, uh, yeah, of course they didn't tell anybody. Uh, and, uh, so one of my sons, um, uh, owns a, a company that uh, does uh, audio, video, and lighting uh, uh, installs. 
And so I had gotten him one of these microphones that I had tested, and it was, this is beautiful. And he was using it for tuning his tuning sound systems. And then he came back to me, he says, Dad, I'm wondering if there's something wrong with this microphone, because the last couple of uh, systems I tuned did, didn't sound right. Hmm. And I tested it, and sure enough, the microphone had changed. And wow. the best we can figure is that it, it sat in the sun a little bit too much at some point. And, gotcha. uh, and so he, he's now using nothing but the microphones with the titanium diaphragms, which have hugely greater uh, ability to withstand heat. So it, this, is, this is, I'm sure, not just a problem in measurement microphones. This is probably also an issue that you would run into regarding your, I guess what you would refer to as grade two, was it? Or grade B microphones? Like the regular well, recording it, microphones that we run into. Well, they, you know, they, the type one and type two are two different grades of measurement microphones. But oh. yes, uh, uh, one time, and I really wish I had these, these test results still, but um, I got hired to test every microphone in the uh, microphone closet of uh, CBS TV uh, oh, New wow. York City. Wow, that would have been I, awesome. I, and and this wasn't even every microphone they owned. These, these were just the ones that weren't on a set right now. Right. Okay. So there was something like 150 microphones. Mm. And one of the most fascinating things was, uh, you know, looking at two nominally identical microphones, same brand, same model, and how consistent were they? Right. Now, these, of course, these are all used microphones that, who knows, could be, uh, you know, They'd in their inventory for 10 years or yeah. something. Yeah. And, and some of them were, uh, you know, really, really close uh, to each other still in their, in their responses. And uh, some of them were embarrassingly bad. In fact, I flagged a few serial numbers for them and I said, you might want to retire these, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, um, the, one of the, one of the interesting things I can still remember from, from doing that test was many years ago um, was that um, the, uh, the microphone that was the absolute most consistent were Sennheiser MKE twos. They're little lapel mics. Yeah. Those were, uh, I mean, no matter how old the, old the mic was, those were just amazingly consistent sample wow. to sample. And uh, so, you know, it's like whatever Sennheiser was doing in the in the design of that microphone, they 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 did it right, and uh, you know. Uh, as again, this is this is all used microphones from the from their you know CBS TV's inventory, and uh, but uh, there were there were some some other microphones that you know varied all over the place to sample to sample. So let me ask you this then: there are some microphones that we use in the film industry that, when you look at the frequency response curve and you look at the specs. They should be very different when you look at them you, it, it, because the microphones sound completely different. Yet, when you look at them, it looks almost identical. The, the frequency response of those microphones look almost identical. This is two different manufacturers, three different manufacturers, yet they still look very similar. What could be some of the reasons why they look similar but they sound very different? Well, I, I, again, you're probably only looking at the on axis. Right. And and, and, then, and and in all fairness, that's usually where we are trying to focus. We're trying to use the null parts of those microphones against noises that we don't want to hear. So we are concentrating on on access sound. Yeah, but, uh, um, you know, the uh, the microphones, which um, the on axis versus off axis response, um seems to be uh, make the, the 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 most dramatic listening differences uh i would say are probably shotgun microphones so and 
I'm sorry. You know, uh, and you know, and, and so uh, there's a handful of manufacturers which have made uh, uh, shotgun mics that have deservedly floated to the top of what you know uh, people uh, like to use. At least if they've had a bit of experience with them, they always tend to gravitate towards the same you know, handful of, uh, of models. And uh, I, I believe that's because the, um, not, not necessarily even the, the, the 90 or 180 degree off axis, just the, you know, 20 degree or 30 degree off axis responses. Uh, how much does that deviate from the on axis? So and, a microphone, uh, so, when you see, I'm sorry to interrupt, when you see that frequency response that they post, is that a sum of all the frequencies together as they test? Or what exactly is that? If they don't post the on axis, the 90 degree and the 180 degree, what is it that we are looking at then? You're, you're looking at on axis. So they only are looking at the on axis. So that's yes. the reason why Bandrew at Podcastage, when he tested two Marantz Pro microphones, that had the same frequency response posted, but they sounded very much different. It could be simply that they are only posting the on-axis frequency response, but the microphones themselves sound very different because of the off-axis 90 degree and 180 degree, and even probably even, you know, maybe even 30 and 60 and 90 and everything else. It could be very different yeah. in that sense. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, so... Uh, I, again, uh, uh, looking at a uh, at a, a polar response can be useful, uh, and uh, you know it, it just just sort of depends. Either the polar response or the multiple uh, individual frequency responses at different angles right. uh, overlaid. Those those can all be useful ways of looking at the microphones and and at how they deviate from their on axis. Uh, response as you as you as you go off axis so it's not and, just so the frequency response as it's posted is the on axis but you can only therefore look at the polar response of that microphone and assume it's ba basically going down the barrel as soon as you start to deviate on the sides at all even though that's the sum of all those frequencies as it comes together to make a typical sound of a microphone it is deviating quite a bit, but it's not necessarily being posted. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, I mean, um, you know, if you were to get, say, uh, uh, a, a Sennheiser uh, long shotgun uh, microphone, which is very popular for, uh, for film, uh, you know, sort of, sort of pick up. Versus, uh, say, a, a Sheps hypercardioid. Uh, now, the if you're if you're trying to reject uh, really a lot from the from the sides, uh, you know, maybe the, the the shotgun would be a a better uh, choice. But uh, if your environment was was a was a bit better controlled, and you didn't have as much ambient stuff that you needed to reject. You might prefer to be using that that Sheps hypercardioid because as as it goes off axis, even though the the Sennheiser is really well behaved for for a shotgun, it's not as well behaved as that as that uh, uh, Sheps uh, hypercardioid uh, capsule as you go. You know, within a working range of say right. thirty degrees of each side of uh, of uh, of on axis. So now let me ask you this then: If you are testing a short shotgun or a long shotgun or a super cardioid, cardioid, whatever the case may be, do you typically test a, the frequency response, or do you test the measurement when you take a measurement of the microphone? Do you typically maybe 18 inches off the mic, that's where you might choose for a super cardioid or a cardioid, but you might back up four or five feet on a long shotgun because that's where it's, it's supposed to be most, that's where you would use it. I mean, if I take, if I take a 
long microphone, like for example, the Sennheiser MKH 816 or an MKH 70, that thing is, is, is super long. And if I were to take that and talk straight down the barrel of it, maybe even 18 inches away, it, that, that's going to be engaged in the proximity effect even at that distance because it's not designed to be listened that closely. And that's going to deviate very yeah. much from a CMC 641 Sheps microphone at the same distance because that's a cardioid, a super cardioid. Yeah, and, and, and it's a small, physically small, front-to-back microphone. doesn't have that big, long interference to Correct. Um, now, the, the, the other thing that, that people don't understand, and uh, um, I have something on it in my microphone book, uh, but which uh, I hope in the next edition to to make it, it clearer. There are people sell, selling these uh, shotgun microphones where the the interference tube is you know that long. Yeah. And they're calling this a shotgun microphone. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's only you don't be getting that the interference tube is so short that it's it's only getting you that narrow pickup pattern. Um, above, uh, you know, 5K or 8K. And uh, where that long shotgun microphone uh, might be getting down to, you know, 500 to 1K, uh, where it's narrow and then widening up below that. At the, at the lower frequencies, these microphones are generally either supercardioid or hypercardioid. Uh, uh, designs and the and the in, and the interference tube, the shotgun part on the front of it is narrowing it down above a, a certain frequency, but that frequency can be determined pretty much directly by the length of that microphone. The longer that tube, the lower in frequency it still it is actually behaving like a shotgun, right? As opposed to behaving like. Uh, uh, a supercardioid or hypercardioid. Right. So, I mean, a supercardioid, if I'm five feet away from that microphone, the low end part of my voice is not going to carry nearly as well as it will to a shotgun microphone. So, if you were testing a shotgun microphone, would you back it off quite a bit more than you would a supercardioid from your test speaker, from your coaxial test speaker? <laughs> uh, or would you keep it in the that same is, distance? That, 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 that is... That is probably one of the the issues of you know how do you how do you test it because with with an omni microphone it the the, the test distance doesn't really matter a whole lot right right you know but uh, the more directional a microphone gets the more uh, that that uh, that the test distance uh, uh, makes makes a difference in the response, and then if you and it, it gets really crazy if you if you're trying to make meaningful measurements of a microphone that's designed for close talking, mm. because uh, you know is is the microphone a quarter inch from the face of the loudspeaker or half an inch? That will make a difference at the low end. Yes, it will. And because low and, ends, it spreads out really quickly in the air. And 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 and, and then the the other thing is um, uh, large diaphragm mics are sometimes, but not always, done with a double capsule. In other words, that capsule has two diaphragms. Right. It has one on each face. And you get the pattern by how the, the diaphragms are polarized. And so that double diaphragm construction, I mean, people have known for ages uh, since, you know, I don't, I don't know who first came up with the, uh, the, the double diaphragm type design, but certainly Neumann popularized it with, with a lot of their large diaphragm mics. And uh, the... People have known that when you work it up real close, the, uh, the the low end boost, that proximity boost, it had a different character to it. It had a different sound, but nobody really knew why. Uh, and then, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, 
Schur published a paper where they they one of their researchers dug into it and figured out technically why that that proximity effect on a double diaphragm type capsule uh, sounded different from the proximity effect on on other directional uh, uh, microphone designs and uh, so yeah there's there's you know, and we've been making those microphones for, you know, uh, I mean, they they were they first came out in Germany during World War II, and uh, you know, so it's it's been a long time, but it's only relatively recently that we figured out some of these these details of why they they sound different. So let me ask you this then: When you typically measure a microphone, what distance are you off of the coaxial speaker? Are you approximately? 18 inches off when you personally test or closer to two feet or one foot? Uh, I, I probably do uh, most of my measurements at roughly a meter. From oh, really? The, uh, but I guess you're kind of in a, the, in a, the, you're an acoustically treated space. So you're getting a very, well, again, I'm, 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 I'm doing a virtual anechoic right. uh, measurement by uh, time windowing out the, all, all the room reflections. So let me ask you this so then. It, if you're testing your microphone at one meter away and I suddenly take that same microphone and I speak into it at four inches off the mic, let's, let's say a, a large diaphragm condenser, and I speak uh, four inches off the mic, am I going to then have and be, is that frequency response that you measured at one meter going to apply to me at four inches or is that going to totally change? the you're going to get a real low end uh, boost uh, uh, on the uh, uh, on that that closer uh, uh, positioning micro yeah. positioning uh, probably if you want if you want to get a really dramatic example of that uh, get a get a uh, uh, a large diaphragm ribbon mic right uh, you yeah. know, like a like a uh, a 77 DX or something like that, you know, and you started out at, at, uh, you know, 18 inches away and you just start bringing it in and bringing it in and oh, bringing yeah. it in and bringing it in. And man, does the, does the low, the low end just, Shoots you up. know, heads for the sky as, as you, as you, as you get it, as you work it real close. So and, let me ask uh, you this then, sorry to interrupt yet again. If I were to be a manufacturer of a large diaphragm condenser, if I post a frequency response of a microphone I tested at a meter away like you're testing, how can someone look at that frequency response and if they're talking off maybe six inches or four inches off the mic, how can they rely on the frequency response that you post or that any manufacturer posts and take that seriously? Well, okay. Uh, part of that, um, uh, you, you will you will see that at least some manufacturers will have the main curve, which is the so we say the distant pickup, the one meter or whatever uh, uh, away uh, response. But then they will have dotted in over it, uh, uh, you know, maybe two curves with considerable low end boosts to them that uh, were taken at closer distances. But then not all of them do that. They sometimes just post one. Most manufacturers I yes. can think of post one frequency response and they expect that to kind of tell you that what the frequency response of that microphone is. And if it's at one meter off and I'm always trying to get like my boom microphones within about four inches or so of the top of someone's head or a large diaphragm condenser is right here in my face, that that to me seems like that testing method may not be ideal for telling me how that microphone is going to sound for my application. Does that make yes. sense? That is true. So how you can know, manufacturers? Uh, but you're, okay. you're going, you're going, you're going to know that it. You're going to know you're going to get a low end, low frequency boost. Right. Uh, so and that's not something that you can look at a frequency response and tell. Just like you can't tell certain things like the clarity and the transparency of the microphone itself from looking at a frequency response. There are many things you can't tell by looking at the frequency response alone or even the specifications alone. Right. You have to physically yeah. hear the microphone. Yes. 
there there are there the 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 more subtle details you know it it's we do the tests we do on just about anything but microns in particular in this case because they're what are easy to do and have been shown to you know correlate you know to to a reasonable degree with what we're hearing but that is not saying that they are the most important things, you know, uh, in in life. Uh, I mean, I, one way to comparison I like to use is analog recording and analog technology has been around for ages and ages. Right. Right. And you know, we 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 learned, you know, well, if we made a measure the frequency response, that means something. And uh, if we measure the total harmonic distortion. That that means something, you know. If, if it has a high distortion, we can we can hear that, and uh, and and so on. And then when you got into uh, tape recorders or uh, even uh, you know uh, records, LPs, um, you you got into speed variations. You know, if that if that record wasn't perfectly centered, and uh, so it it. it wobble a little bit as it, as it as it played while well, you would get a, a pitch variation as the, as the record went around and it wasn't perfectly concentric oh yes you know same thing with a tape recorder if the mechanical pieces in the tape path weren't perfect you know you get subtle speed variations right and so we, we we came up with a measure for this called wow and flutter you know wow being the lower rate changes in pitch and flutter being very high high rate uh, changes in pitch, and now we 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 went to digital recording suddenly, and ah, oh, it's this is wonderful. The frequency response is flat, uh, and and can go down to DC if we wanted, not the low end, uh, and the. Wow and flutter. What's that? It doesn't exist, uh, you know. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, t uh, THD uh, really, really low. And we listened to this, and a lot of people went, "Pew! It sounds lousy." And we're going, "Wait a minute! But it's so much better in all of these ways that we measured that were important for analog recording." Mm -hmm. And especially in the early days of digital, we didn't really know because the technology was so different. We didn't really know what to measure that would correlate with what we're hearing. So the recording medium that you're recording that microphone on, I guess also matters with regards to how you're listening, because I've noticed that if you listen to one preamp versus another preamp, they do add their own special sound based on the manufacturer to that particular microphone. So it's not as simple as as simply saying the microphone sounds this way. If I go through to my computer through a Focusrite 2i4, for example, versus a sound device's Mix Pre 6, it could sound different in, in that alone just because of the components that it's passing through before I get to, to the recording. Oh, yeah. And, and so as the technology changes, we're having to learn what um, what what to to measure that will correlate well with what we're hearing, and mm. uh, you know. So today you can go and buy quote digital microphones. Yes. And uh, uh, Neumann, among others, uh, uh, makes makes these in the. The AES has even gotten a, a standard for uh, digital output of a, a directly out of a microphone. Mm -hmm. But the microphone itself is still the same transducer, should we say, in in the in the microphone. It's just that you've packaged the preamp and the A to D converter in the microphone case instead of them being, you know, 50 feet away on a, on the end of a microphone cable. Right. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and there's some advantages to, to packing it all into that, into that microphone, but 
the microphone fundamental technology is still the same. It's still that analog design. And there are certainly companies trying to come up with ways of making microphones where what comes right out of the capsule itself is digital. Right. Which will, which will change things once again. And we'll, we'll have to, uh, we'll have to learn what to measure that will be meaningful with that new technology microphone. So right now with the AES, trying to get microphone manufacturers to cooperate and send you the samples and no one really doing that would you say that it is more difficult for you to make a standard whereas you can count on the microphone test that the manufacturers do they're not all the same between the manufacturers one company could you choose to test their microphones at one meter versus another one that could choose to do it at 18 inches and that's going to drastically yes. make that can make a microphone sound better or worse simply by the the distance at which they test their microphones yep and and there's a lot of different different things uh like that that of of how the testing is done and uh that will will make uh, we'll, we'll make differences in the in the in the test results, and hopefully, through the the work of the AES Standards Committee, um, at least the better manufacturers are going to wind up with results that are more consistent from manufacturer to manufacturer. That's great. So. You know, it's it's got a long way to go, but it's it's getting it's especially since moving it's in the right direction. Especially with it ever changing, yeah. I can imagine how difficult it is. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, you know, uh, well, I mean, the 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 if you go way back, uh, microphones were uh, a dia a a metallic cup, a diaphragm, and in between. A bunch of crushed carbon granules, and the diaphragm pressed on the crushed carbon, and as the diaphragm moved in and out, the the carbon got compressed more or less, and so more or less electricity would get through. Basically, the resistance varied. Right. And when I was when I was a kid, that was still how the uh, microphones in the, you remember the old fashioned telephone handset? I do. You know, with the earpiece the and a, a mouthpiece? television, the, the POTS telephone system. Yeah. And so those, those earlier uh, uh, microphone capsules in there were, you know, this, this carbon button design. And so that worked well enough for, Barely, you know, reasonable speech intelligibility uh, on on a on a telephone, uh, but then, you know, uh, we from from there, you know, we got into dynamic microphones, both the moving coil style, and then the the ribbon style, and uh, those each had their own advantages and disadvantages and different sounds. And uh, if you if you looked at, for example, the uh, originally Western Electric and then later was sold as the Alltech uh, 639 uh, microphone, it was a big birdcage mm -hmm. uh, uh, microphone, and that had an omni dynamic and a bidirectional uh, ribbon element in the same case. Oh, stacked one above each other. And if you combine the, if you match the sensitivity and combine the outputs of those two, you had a cardioid microphone. Right. Now I know that you could do and the that, same kind of thing with an omni the, and, a, and a binaural. Go ahead. Yeah. And so it was an omni and a bidirectional mm -hmm. and uh, the, the ribbon being the bidirectional. And, and so uh, then uh, the, the first version of this, you had a three position selector switch. That let Which you one choose. do you hear or the combination? Yeah, yeah. One, you know, the 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 omni 
the bidirectional or the two together, which made a cardioid. cardioid. Yeah. And then uh, later, when when Alltech took over the manufacturing of the thing, or the name changed, really, uh, then they added besides the, those, they added three more positions, which were differing combinations that weren't one to one of the two elements. Right. And so, but besides getting different polar patterns out of it. The two the two microphone elements, the the ribbon and the and the and dynamic omni, uh, also had very different frequency responses, mm. and and so as you combine them oh, in yeah. different amounts, and you got different, different on axis, you got different on axis frequency responses. Yeah, and and so that was a that was a fascinating microphone for uh, uh, certain uses because you could change change the the sound very dramatically, the on axis sound. Very dramatically by which one of those six switch positions you use. Wow, that's neat. And and uh, so, I guess we kind of know. electronically do that now. Well, we we can we do we we have elect electronic equalizers and so on. I mean, uh, and again, so that that was your 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 first your carbon buttons, then your uh, dynamic, then the ribbons, and uh, then we got into the condenser. Uh, des designs and uh, the, the condenser designs originally <coughs> all required a, uh, a voltage between the back plate and the diaphragm uh, and you typically like a 200 volt bias on, on the things and when the electronics in them were, were tubes that wasn't uh, too bad because you had to have a power supply that supplied power for the, operating the tube, and that required a high voltage supply, and so you could tap that off and 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 polarize the uh, the capsule with it. But uh, then, as we went to transistors, you know, it became less convenient to supply high voltage across it, and uh, back in. Uh, I think it was 48, uh, uh, somebody at, I might be wrong, but I, th I think it was Bell Labs, uh, came up with uh, a um, condenser microphone that didn't need uh, uh, an external polarization. Uh, basically, he found that there were certain materials, in particular certain plastics, that if you applied a high voltage uh, across them with a with a plastic molten, and then let it cool off. <clears throat> the charge would be frozen into the surface of the plastic. Oh. And uh, then, if you took that plastic and made it into the diaphragm of a condenser mic, you can you can get a condenser microphone that uh, uh, did not need a high voltage power supply to polarize the capsule wow. and uh, so that was the uh, the so-called electret uh, which we design. still use today we use that on a lot of lavalier yes. microphone but transmitters ex 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 except we've learned how to make them much much better than right. the early ones because in the early days the electret condensers <coughs> were Distinctly worse performance-wise than the the externally polarized uh, condensers. Uh, today, that isn't necessarily the case. Wow! Uh, you could you can get uh, electret design uh, uh, microphones that are just as good uh, performance-wise as uh, uh, ones with a high with a high voltage polarization. Now That's that gets into <laughs> the uh, the the issue of humidity because when as soon as you get to a high voltage you get into this you know like leakage currents across the insulators and if there's even the slightest little bit of dust or dirt on that you get crackling noises mm. with with a high voltage across it and so the uh, when you had a tube in the microphone, the tube generated heat, and the heat drove off the humidity, 
which then you didn't get dirt sticking to the insulating surfaces because there was humidity there to, to glue it in place. Uh, but once you went to uh, uh, a transistor design, you didn't have that heat being generated. And so your microphones were much more sensitive to humidity. Your condenser microphones uh, were much more sensitive to humidity, and humidity can cause a lot of noise problems. They with can, them. yeah. And uh, I, I had a situation where I was uh, uh, recording a concert pianist in an old stone church in lower Manhattan. And uh, it was, I was using a, a pair of uh, AKG C451E uh, microphones, and which were con uh, uh, high voltage polarized condensers with transistor electronics. And we had enough humidity in the church that it was it was causing a real problem. Mm. And so I wound uh, uh, a uh, uh, a heater uh, heating element out of uh, uh, nichrome wire c uh, covered with uh, Teflon tubing and wound it around the the top say inch of the uh, of the microphone body to warm it up just be just behind where the where the element screwed on and applied uh, dc to that from a variable voltage power supply so i could get it warm enough that it was you know just warm to the touch drove the humidity out and we didn't have noise problems in the recordings that is awesome so uh n now with but with electrets uh, there's no longer uh, any high voltage, and so you don't have the same sensitivity to humidity. Yeah. And and again, the the, the new AKG C451s, the B series C451Bs, uh, use electret type capsules on them, and so they don't have this problem. And uh, so. Uh, while there there is a bit of a fad right now because so many microphones at home was, was like every condenser mic you, you looked at seemed to be going to a, to an electric design. But now there's a been a, a been a fad going. Well, okay, you can get the electric you get electric ones, but the really good microphones are going to have the, the high voltage uh, polarization or external polarization. In fact, some people call them real condensers as opposed to electric condensers, which are still real condenser mics, just done differently. But, uh, uh, you know, people who are, who are buying a microphone because it's a real condenser don't realize that it's also now sensitive to humidity like your electric wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's, there's advantages and disadvantages, again, to, to both types of, of designs. And, and that's one of those things that, you know, you're not going to find on a spec sheet, you know, how, 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 how much of a noise problem it has with this microphone has when, with humidity. You know, that's, that's one of the things that will never wind up in a spec sheet. Right. Now, uh, actually, uh, I think your microphone is touching your cable there. If you, if you might need to, I'm getting a lot of noise from it. I have a couple of questions okay. here. I have a couple of questions. That's much better. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you then. Um, why is it then that a lot of microphones do a, a presence boost somewhere in the upper vocal range? Usually somewhere between about 4K and 6K, usually they start some sort of upper trend to, to, to get, you know, a couple of extra dB out of it. Why do they do that? I think that that was, again, sort of a, a, a fad thing, and it started off for a good technical reason. Um uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one of the old Sure All-in-One all PA packages that they called the uh, Sure Vocal Master. And it, it was a column column loudspeakers with this little mixer power amp and, and then typically sold with S SM58 microphones. And the that presence boost in the upper response of the SM58 matched up amazingly well with the high frequency roll off in the in the column loudspeakers they were selling
Gotcha. And so the combination worked. And so, of course, today we have much better loudspeakers that have much smoother and more extended high-frequency response. But there's still this, this, well, this is what a microphone should sound like. You yeah. know, Even uh, though that thing in, particular, people's heads. in particular to me, it drives me crazy because I hear all the sibilance and I hear all the high frequency sounds that I don't want to necessarily hear. It drives me crazy yeah. personally. And, and, and if you, uh, uh, you know, sure later came out with uh, the Beta 58. Yes. And uh, that reduced the amount of. Uh, uh, that that high high frequency boost, and uh, also uh, distinctly improved the uh, off axis rejection, and yes, made it much and smoother it's a than it was. Blade. Yeah, and then it then it did with the uh, uh, with the uh, uh, the original SM58, and uh, but you know personally, if I had to choose between those two microphones, I take the Beta any day. Yeah. But there's a lot of people still who, oh, they got to have their SM58. Right. I actually personally it's, like super cardioids they, better than they, cardioids. It's, it's what they've become accustomed to. So it's people being trendy still is the reason why it continues yeah. to happen. I think so. Wow. So let me ask you this then. If I were to look at the spec sheet, there is a deviation that I could potentially count on being like plus or minus – two or three db regarding the uh the frequency response but there's also going to be plus or minus a little bit in the sensitivity in the noise floor in the other specs as well is there any place on a frequency uh, response chart or in the specifications that tells you how much is acceptable deviation or how much you can expect i think you will find that that is one of the closely guarded secrets of most manufacturers yeah I would think so. Uh, I, I, uh, I've I done uh, the sound systems for the hearing rooms uh, for the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. And between the two, they have something like 108 hearing rooms. And I've done the sound systems for most of them. And those re require anything from 30 to 90 microphones per system. So that's an awful lot of, of microphones. Yes, it is. And we would we would really like them to be consistent from sample to sample. And yet we found that, uh, and in fact, at one point we were, uh, as we would commission the system, we would go around and we would put a, a calibrator over the end of each microphone and tweak the preamp gain so that the net level into the system was absolutely consistent from all the microphones. Problem was, we didn't realize that they would then, at the end of the day, they would take all the microphones down, pack them away in the closet, oh, no. and then the next day they put up random in order. The user room, they 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 put them back out in random order, oh. and and so tweaking the preamp gains to match the the microphone sensitivities actually made things worse <laughs> than making the preamp so much for sound exactly pros being same. involved <laughs> and uh but with those you know pretty good quality gooseneck microphones we were using there was probably sample of sample 3 db changes in in sensitivity so that's and, a that's a general rule if we were to say a blanket not necessarily a rule to follow but if I were to say that the frequency response that's posted could be a deviation of plus or minus maybe 3 dB, that's, that would not be outrageous to say. That could very well be something that, that people out there, the viewers of this right now interview, they could maybe say plus or minus 3 dB is what they could count on as a general rule. Is that a fair statement? Uh, well, what I was talking about in particular was the sensitivity, which is how much – Output you got for gotcha. one kilohertz uh, tone, but yes, you you're going to get uh, deviations, and they're going to be lesser in the mid range and greater at the at the frequency extremes. 
Uh, but, uh, you know, two, uh, you know, anything from one and a half to three dB, uh, plus or minus deviations in, in the response or, you know, I, I'd say pretty, pretty typical. Which could be basically a difference between three dB and six dB because if it's plus or minus, it basically doubles. Now, what is that mm. mid range frequency range that you would say is probably fairly consistent across microphones? Oh, uh, you know, um, from, uh, you know, if you go in sort of the 500 to, you know, three or four K, uh, that's where most of your voice energy is. And, and, uh, you know, your, your better microphones, uh, are going to, uh, um, they're going to see the biggest changes in the in the response sample to sample above 4K. And, so basically uh, above the fundamental frequency of the human voice. Yes. Gotcha. Well, Ray, thank you so much for joining us. Let me ask you this. Tell us a little bit about your book and where we can find it. Oh, um, yeah. The, you can find it on, uh, on uh, Amazon. And uh, uh, let's see. It's, uh, I'll put a link down in the description. Uh, th yeah. Uh, it's called the microphone book or actually, uh, it, they, they put er cause it, it was originally written by the first two editions were written by John Ergel. And then I did the third edition. And so it's called Ergel's the microphone book, uh, and then by Ray Rayburn. And, uh, so if you go to any of my websites, I'll have, uh, a link, uh, a link to that uh, on it. And you also have a bunch of technical information on your website, soundfirst.com. Yes. And uh, uh, particularly if, if for people who are interested in, uh, uh, you know, uh, old microphones and stuff, uh, let me see if I can quickly uh, get to this. Uh, uh, one of the, uh, the things I have down at the bottom of my technical page is, um, uh, I used to work for, uh, RCA records in, uh, New York city and, um, uh, uh, RCA closed, uh, their, uh, uh, they used to have studios all over the country and around the world and they closed many of them. And, uh, so they, when they closed the, uh, uh, studio in Hollywood, uh, they sold some gear, they threw some stuff out and then they sent some of the stuff to the studios in New York. Uh, and one of the things that they, they sent, uh, was the master reference book for disc recording which was issued in February 1940 by the recording department of RCA Manufacturing. Oh, yeah. And basically, this was the guidebook for all of their studios worldwide. There were only 15 copies of the book ever made. Wow. And it has full manuals on all of the microphones, the loudspeakers, the custom-made mixing consoles, the Scully disc cutting lathes, all of this. They had full pictures wow. and manuals on all of this equipment, including uh, a big fold-out uh, blueprints of the wiring of the consoles and, and, and so on. And uh, Gosh, so, that's got to be neat to look at. Yeah. And, and so when uh, when the powers that be in uh, uh, RCA in New York decided to throw this book out. I grabbed it out of the oh, trash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, then uh, uh, years later, uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Doug Jones, uh, managed to uh, get this whole thing turned into a PDF. And uh, including all the, the, including the big uh, blueprints, and uh, then, uh, as, as he originally sent it to me, it was an absolutely monstrous file. And then I, I went through it with the, the PDF software and where it was able to 
reduce the file size without reducing the, the, the image quality noticeably. And so now it's this 386 page book and it's now down to 46.7 megabytes. Still, that's, and, that's a heck of a size though, still, but yeah, all the information. And, and so I have that on the bottom of my uh, technical page. You can download that book wow. and uh, <laughs> uh, uh, see. I'll have to check that know, out. <laughs> what, what was the state of the art of uh, of recording equipment in 1940? In 1940. <laughs> Before World War II really even got started. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and of course, this was uh, all recording direct to lacquer, you know, because mm -hmm. tape tape recorders, you know, uh, you know, yeah. hadn't had uh, were actually invented by the Germans during World War Two, and uh, uh, oh, which is, is sort of an interesting little little tidbit. Uh, during World War Two, obviously, the Allies really, really wanted to kill Hitler. Oh yeah. And so they would hear Hitler giving a speech over a radio station and say, that quality is so great, he's got to be live. This is not, a, they're not playing a record. Oh. And they would bomb the radio stations trying to kill Hitler. And oh, it, wow. they never got him because it was a Neumann condenser mic feeding uh, feeding a magnetophon uh, tape recorder, which is the the first tape recorder in the world. Wow! And the and the sound quality was so good that we thought it had to be live. And that's something you will <laughs> never see in a history book either. Yeah, that is awesome. And and, and, and so we we kept on trying to kill Hitler by bombing radio stations. Well, they were playing records, basically. Yeah, they were playing playing uh, tape recordings. That is uh, awesome. Of, of 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 his uh, of his speeches. Oh, that is amazing. Oh, that's and, awesome. And uh, then, uh, of, of course, uh, uh, after uh, uh, the, uh, the at the end of World War Two, um, uh, the uh, one one of our soldiers uh, had uh, managed to grab a hold of one of these magnetophon tape recorders and uh, took it back to the United States and basically that became Ampex. Oh. Yes. Wow. And uh, another one of our soldiers managed to grab some bags of the oxide powder that they were coating on the paper because uh, it was paper tape right? Uh, to make the magnetic recording tape and uh, uh, that was a Mr. Orr, and uh, uh, so his his company is now what you know, was Scotch recording tape. Wow, that is really cool. And, and so you had you had that. That's where the uh, magnetic recording industry uh, came from in the U.S. It's it's some soldiers stealing the German stuff <laughs> and copying it when they got back. All the better reason not to be a draft dodger because you could launch your entire career based on information you steal from your enemies. That is, yeah. <laughs> that is so awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ray. I really appreciate you taking the time. You're very that's, welcome. That's that's amazing. And uh, and yeah. and by all means, please, if you have some documentation, like we've talked, you've talked a little bit about schematics. You've you maybe if you have pictures of your recording space, anything like that that you'd like to send me to, to put in there, I will gladly do so. What I will most likely do is I will take and um, the attention span of someone on YouTube is usually around, you know, four to six minutes. I'll probably cut to, cut together in segments this interview yeah. and I will release it and then I will have the entire video available and strongly recommend people wanting it, uh, listening to it and watching it if they really want to just hear some amazing stuff. Because th this has been fascinating to me, it really has been, and I so appreciate. You know, I, it. I, I, uh, uh, in in the book, uh, the 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 first chapter is sort of a history of microphones, and 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 then the last chapter is uh, here's some of the great microphones uh, from history. It's sort of like what 
what would you know sort of classic microphones that everybody should know about yeah is That's is awesome. a, is the last chapter in the book and this and is it, it goes along with my some of my interests in the in this stuff because i find the 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 history of uh, of recording uh, and, and so on uh, to being uh, fascinating. Oh, it's it's very fascinating, especially when you tell it. It's really neat. I mean, geez, that could be a whole section of a, a history of sound in you know uh, throughout history. Sound throughout history could be an awesome series. So yeah, well, the uh, actually, um, uh, if you're interested in that sort of things, um, the. Uh, historical group within the Audio Engineering Society has a lot of great materials, including uh, uh, interviews with uh, a lot of the people that were the movers and shakers that you know invented the uh, the various bits of sound and recording technology and uh, and uh, and acoustics and things. And uh, I, I mean. Uh, uh, today, everybody, of course, knows about the internet, but uh, do you know that that came out of an acoustics company? Wow. I uh, yeah, the uh, 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 oh, uh, now, now, I'm, now I'm blanking, of course, uh, but uh, 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 there was a um, uh, Based out of uh, uh, Massachusetts, uh, there there were uh, two, and then later a third uh, professor from uh, 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 I believe MIT that uh, started uh, uh, an acoustics uh, consulting business uh, on on the on the side, and. Uh, uh, did all sorts of stuff. A lot of it for uh, for the uh, uh, the uh, U.S. government, and uh, so uh, uh, anyway, um, they they were sort of a th became a think tank for everything to do with acoustics, and uh, somebody told them, "Hey, this this one professor is going to become available. Why don't you you get him?" And he they went and talked with him, and they found out. Well, yeah, he was doing stuff with uh, computers in the this is very early days, obviously. And uh, uh, you know, it was like, well, you know, the problem was not his salary; the problem was the cost of the computer he did. Mm. And uh, uh, so, uh, one day he called him in and uh, and said, uh, "Hey, look at this!" And he had a whole bunch of uh, computer terminals hooked all to this one computer. Instead of having a computer and a terminal to run it, he had a whole bunch of these these terminals, and you could be doing a different job on each terminal, all on the same same computer at the same time. Hmm. And they said, "Hey, that's 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 pretty neat. Yeah, I could reduce costs of uh, of things and so on." And he says, "Yeah, but here's the real thing." You can put these terminals in different points around the world. Yes. And so they got some military uh, funding, and uh, that became DARPAnet, which was the predecessor of the internet. Hmm. And uh, um, uh, so uh, now I'm I'm still blanking on the on the name. Um, of the, uh, but anyway, the, the main backbone of the internet is still from that company. And, uh, the, uh, the, the that's it. Bolt, Brannick, and Newman. The first I'm, two guys were Bolt, Bolt, I'm sorry, and Brannick. Repeat that. I just had to restart. I just had to, had to re, I just had to restart the recording because, uh, it was about to hit its cap. So go ahead. And who was it again? Bolt, Baranek, and then later Newman joined them. And uh, Bolt and Baranek, uh, uh, one of their their early jobs was designing the first sound system for the U.S. Senate chamber. And uh, I've seen the original blueprints of that because I did 
a much later replacement of that system. Uh, but uh, that was designed in 1948 and installed in 49. And uh, uh, that uh, anyway, later, shortly thereafter, uh, Newman joined them and the firm became Bolperanik and Newman. And then they hired this, uh, this uh, professor and uh, that did the computer stuff. And that led to the basically the invention of the internet. And uh, uh, to this day, uh, if you look at the backbones of the internet, the main one is BBN, which is both Brannick and Newman. Gotcha. And their acoustics business, which is where they started from, got spun off and sold off separately as a Centec. Huh. And and because that became the tail wag that the the you know the 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 internet became the tail that wagged the dog. Yeah, seriously, and, uh, it's the backbone, and, uh, of course. Yeah, and then uh, the uh, 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 but Baranek, uh not only wrote a huge amount of like college textbooks on acoustics and and stuff like that, but he also. Uh, after he left uh, uh, BBN, uh, became the, I believe it's president or anyway, the head of the uh, of the Boston Symphony for something like ten or fifteen years. Gotcha. And uh, uh, he uh, uh, does, uh, you know, concert hall design and 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 things like this. And the last I heard, which is probably two years ago. He was over a hundred and still going strong. Wow, that's amazing. That really is awesome. But I, the, A, the AES in their historical section has a recording of uh, an, an evening with both uh, with uh, an evening with Leo Baranek, uh, which I was fortunate to be there live for for that for that evening. But it, it, it's just fascinating. He's talking about this the whole history of this thing and. And uh, you know how he how he came into uh, doing all of this stuff and uh, uh, and, and so on. So, but there's a lot of other great great uh, uh, recordings. Uh, uh, I believe they have one with Les Paul, uh, and uh, you know a, a lot of the other people that that you know invented the stuff that. You know, we we look we we look back at it with awe today. You know, uh, uh, the the AES has managed to uh, uh, do interviews with a lot of these people while they were still alive. That's awesome, and that's good. That's history. I mean, that's that's very important yeah. for us to know because, especially as we move forward, the a lot of the early findings that we have found in recordings, a lot of that still is the basis for what we do now. It's just that we have now tried to figure out new ways of doing the same kind of thing and we're trying to in many ways reinvent the wheel i mean it's it's really amazing to me how you can go back and look at early condensers and the tech hasn't changed a whole lot it's generally the same thing um we have better it, materials now. yes better materials because we we have much better uh it's, it's but, easier to but do. a lot of the fundamental design stuff is the same right thank you so much ray i really appreciate it you're very welcome all right bye-bye bye have a question you'd like answered or want to add something? Be sure to write it in the comment section down below. You can also make a suggestion for future topics of discussion. Again, comment section down below or you can email me at soundspeeds at yahoo.com. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss out on future sound advice.